nonsense, motorcycle suspensions come a long way. We've got uh, automatic electronic preload adjustment like uh, my last Tiger 1200 had and all the GSs and all the big high-end bikes, Ducati Multistrades and stuff like that have. And they can be semi-automatic with uh, rider mode. So uh, again, on my last Triumph, when you change the rider mode to sport, it increased the damping, both fork legs and the rear shock. Lots of other bikes do that as well. But there's lots of people who perhaps would like adjustable damping, but don't want all these electronics. And I look at a lot of bikes coming now, a lot of mid-range bikes coming out now. With uh, mid-range bikes, let's have a look, let's say the Honda Transalp. No adjustable damping. Like, that just seems crazy to me. Uh, a bike with 150 mm suspension, and I know every bike doesn't have to have adjustable damping, but it's just a mechanical valve and a bit of valve work and stuff like that. It can't be that much extra. But they'll prioritize, prioritize things like a, a Bluetooth connectivity so you can get your social media up on your bloody motorbike through your phone. Do, do you need it? You, you don't. Nobody needs that sort of distraction on a bloody motorbike on two wheels. <laughs> I, you know, they, they really should get rid of this shite on motorbikes. Oh God, yeah, old man talking, old man talking. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. We're a bit off, bit, a bit off cock there. <laughs> But I'm a firm believer that they should add adjustable damping to motorbike or suspension just to get the bike perfect for you. It'd be such an easy thing. And I think there's a reason why uh, lots of people don't do it. Uh, well, first off, A, I think a lot of people would like to have a bike with, some, with, with less electronics, less intervention, less all the gadgets and stuff like that. But you don't have to give up fantastic suspension just because you haven't got the electronic gadgetry around it. Manually adjustable suspension can give you a perfect ride, one that suits you, whether you want a sporty one or a plush one or whatever it may be. But I think a lot of manufacturers don't provide manually adjusted suspension bikes because they know a lot of users look at it and go, oh, it's rocket science. It's a black art. It's a dark art. It's not. It's none of those things. It's dead, dead easy. Dead easy. But what I think manufacturers should do is make it really easy. Make your damping adjustment a real no-brainer. And here's my thoughts on it. And here's my thoughts on this is what they should do. And I tell you what, if the Japanese and the British and the American manufacturers don't do it, the Chinese will, because they're putting adjustable damping on everything, even their small little 500s, 600s, and all that sort of stuff. The other manufacturers are going to get with it, provide things basic to the nature of the bike, like adjustable damping. Forget all the bloody other shite. Look, get the fundamentals of the bike right. Chassis, engine, wheels, tire. they do all that stuff great, obviously. But why such shoddy work on bloody suspension? Fancy prioritizing a Bluetooth connection over suspension. And that's exactly what they have done because they're trying to dumb down that bike because they think we're all bloody idiots. Well, some of us are idiots. Yeah, yeah. I have been called that before. Uh, yes, I have, yeah. Yes, more, more than once, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So, I'm gonna come up with a suggestion as an idiot-proof damping suspension system. Let's see what you think of this. Just before I look at the damping, just quickly address preload. It's conventional wisdom that we wanna be sitting somewhere around 25 to 30% of our stroke on that rear shock. We want to mainly have compression travel, but have something in reserve for when we go down depressions as well. So we can't have the shock sitting right at the top of its travel. It's somewhere in between. So as we load weight on the bike, we need to add preload when that weight gets excessive and starts overcoming this spring. So we're adding that preload to put pressure back up to get that shock somewhere in that kind of 25 to 30% of its uh, compression stroke. Okay, that's what our preload is for. If you're an average weight person, and the shock is in the factory set position, there's a good chance you don't need to touch it unless you add lots of weight or, or suddenly lose 50 kilos on a great diet. But if you're a, a larger rider or you're taking pillion or a load of gear, you wanna be adding more preload on the back there to try and get that shock back into that 20 to 30% range of operation. Why not make it easier? Why not make it, why, why don't manufacturers make that dead easy for that rider? Let's have a look at a simple system here we could do with this. Imagine having a preload guide on your rear, um, rear swing arm, something like this. So one side's fitted to your swing arm, the other side fitted to the uh, fixed part of your frame. 
So maybe this indicates, oh, well, okay, that's where my, uh, that's where my uh, bike static sag is. And this is my target 25 to 30% sag for my rear suspension on the preload. So I sit on the bike and I go, hey, I go, oh, wow, uh, I'm uh, pushing that a bit too far. So then I might go away, get my tools, grab me a preload adjusters and add a bit of preload. So in my case here, I'm going to add an extra couple of notches of preload to compensate for my weight and do the same the other side. So now when I come and sit on the bike, I get on the bike, I've added my preload now, and I sit on the bike and the bike sags down into the green area. So wouldn't that be something simple for a manufacturer to do? And it takes all that guesswork out of it. You add a pillion, the indicator goes down into the orange area, heading towards the red. Hey, hey, time to add a bit more preload. Get me back into the green area. I know what you're thinking. I can't bloody see that from there, can I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. It, it could be one, you know, it, it could be, you know, a little dial going this way and, you know, the, the needle's facing upwards like a little scale or something like that. Or you could do it in front of a shop mirror. Yeah, that's an option. That's definitely an option um, if you can get close enough. But look, there's a million ways you could do that. But I'm talking about make it simple and mechanical. Okay, so that's it. We've got our rear preload sorted. Now setting the rear suspension to around 25 to 30% sag is a reasonable proposition and it's a great place to start. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the front forks. So setting the front forks to the same sag uh, as your rear, that 25, 30% may end up with the bike uh, being a bit nose down or nose up. Um, and that's particularly the case with this Honda. If I set uh, the sag 30% uh, uh, front, 30% back, the front end of this would be well nose up. So I have to take the suspension travel on this bike with a pinch of salt, and it'll be the same for many others, or could be the same for many others. So uh, if the manufacturers gave us a, uh, a sag target for the front, so here we are, uh, even something as simple as a needle, we could have a uh, the Terence O'Keefe sagometer needle. Yeah, that's it, yeah. So I might have, uh, okay, the target sag for the front forks, rider sag that is, is in the green area, uh, going into a little bit into the orange band, if we're getting a little bit out of that, but definitely not in the red, uh, or you definitely need too many pies if you're in the red. Maybe you could have a little pie logo on the red bit. But so that's the Terence O'Keefe Sagometer, and it's just a simple, again, mechanical design. And Honda or Triumph or BMW, whoever it is, they know what attitude they want on their bike. They know what attitude. That The front and rear suspension on this bike are massively mismatched in terms of uh, rider sag put the suspension, uh, there's front preload adjustment on this bike, put them, the front and the rear preload in the stock position. And the amount of sag this uses on the front end is massively more than it is on the back. So to get rid of all that ambiguity, what Honda could do is give us a target sag area. And it doesn't matter if it's 45%. Okay, if it's 45%, it's 45%. But just tell us what, what, you're, what you would like that front sag to be based on your design of your bike. But look, that's for bikes with front preload adjustment. A lot of them don't have it. So I might not be able to sell too many of the Sago meters, but uh, we'll see. Right, that's preload put to bed. Let's get onto this damping. Here's the damping adjuster on my Daytona. When I bought this bike, uh, it meant nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. And did I read the manual? I'm a bloke, of course I didn't read the manual. So uh, did I change that? Yeah, probably not. I don't ever remember mucking around with the suspension on this bike when I bought it. But look, the manufacturer hasn't made it easy for me. He wants me to read the manual. Oh, my God. And it's no surprise that manufacturers don't bother putting bloody uh, uh, manually adjustable suspension on bikes anymore. Because they know half of us don't use it. So, look, historically, a lot of manufacturers, they're, they're relying on you to read that manual. Uh, some of them might help you a little bit and say have H&S for hard and soft on the damping. Some of, even, some of them even put that on the preload, which I'm not mad about, I'll be honest. So a lot of these damping adjusters, they, they, they just, look, I can read the manual. I know what I'm doing. I've been mucking around with the damping on this now for a couple of years. And I, I'm very comfortable with what I'm doing on damping on bikes. But a lot of people aren't. This is not very user friendly, is it? That, that's not friendly at all, is it? Can we change that? Can we change that? Can we have a damping adjuster on the top of here with a small legend around there to encourage people? You bought a bike with adjustable suspension. 
Here's how to use it in a really simple and easy to use way. Try and put a reasonable stab at it on my Daytona here. On the rear shock, they had a remote damping adjuster. So you didn't have to get underneath and get all your hands dirty. And it used to stick out just here. But uh, the writing's faded on it a bit now, but on the, on the knob, it's marked one to four for damping. But unless you looked the manual up, you didn't know what one meant, you didn't know what four went, but you, you try it out and find out. I don't ever remember turning that knob. <laughs> but at least they had a go at making it easy. And they did have a remote preload adjuster, but it was under the seat. I don't think I ever touched that either. But what if we go a tiny stage further and have a little legend on there, which is easy for everyone to understand. And the legend on the back of this shock's damping adjuster is the same as the legend on the front fork's damping adjuster. So people can feel comfortable that they're putting, if they're putting their damping in rain mode on here, they're putting it in rain mode on the front forks. If they're putting it in a sporty mode here, they're putting it in a sporty mode on the front forks. Taking away that guesswork. But here's my idea anyway for doing that. So instead of this ambiguous one to four on this shock, what Triumph could have done is do something like, okay, here's my road damping, or here's my sport level damping. Here's my road damping. Heavy off-road, mild off-road, rain, two up with luggage, two up, solo with luggage. So this range equates to solo riding and this range here, two up riding. And some of these settings could be the same. So for instance, this sport setting here might be equivalent to our two up and loaded with luggage setting. And you go, no, well, why wouldn't I want a comfy setting for... for for my uh, pillion and stuff. Well, when you've got pillion and a load of luggage, what you would do is actually increase your damping. So that's why it equates to a more sporty feel. Uh, now the ratio is obviously chosen by the manufacturer. They can do it whichever way they want, but isn't that like simple? Like on my uh, legend underneath, I've got these as kind of solo options and these are options to, to choose when you're two up. How, how simple is that? Now we just do the exact same thing and have the same thing on our forks. So as a user, I can just come along. Now, and I don't want 13 clicks to the right and then finish it, stop it all the way and then yeah, uh, do it out eight clicks from fully screwed in and all that. Nobody's going to do that. Just make it a click system like Triumph made it on their rear shock all those years ago. Just get this and have it pointing to where it needs to be. Have whatever gearing mechanism you want underneath that. Just make it simple for the user. So look, oh, I want rain mode damping. Turn it to rain mode. I want sporty damping. Turn it to sporty. I'm two up with my missus and a load of luggage. I'm there. Easy peasy, I'm going off road. Okay, let's say this was from uh, my CB1100. I'm obviously gonna just skip out on these off-road settings and stuff like that and have what's you know more suited to my bike. We just have these for off-road. Because uh, if you look at the Triumph manual for the Tiger 900, they have a couple of different damping settings depending on how rough that off-road is. Uh, but as I say, these icons can be added or taken away. You could put an extra icon in for solo riding and it could be a, a comfort. It could be a picture of a bed, anything. Let's make it easy, but don't stop there. One of the key points of this is to match the front and rear. It's got to be easy for the end user to say, right, uh, it's rain mode, I'm going rain, and let them do the exact same thing on their forks. So here we are, I want sport mode, I just turn it to sport mode. Road mode, turn to road. Off-road, if, if it's an off-road bike, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know what I mean? Oh, it's raining. I got rain mode. Wasn't that easy? None of this. All right, I right, turn 13 clicks backwards, and uh, then go back six clicks, do that on the bottom leg, do that on the top here, do that. Yeah, match the back. Ah, oh, yeah, no, I won't bother. And of course, most people don't. But if you've got a single function fork that does the uh, compression and rebound, Oh, that could be one handy knob on the top there. And then one handy one on the uh, rear monoshock. If it's a monoshock bike, wouldn't that be easy? Road, off-road, sport. And manufacturers, if you wanted to be uh, really handy now, what you could do. Now, yeah, these don't necessarily have to click on each one individually. Uh, it could be, there could be a mid position in each of these or multiple positions in front of them. Or if you're really canny, you can tell the rider uh, just before you go out, stand on your scales, get your weight. Oh, look, you're 105 kilos. And you could have this as an adjustable ring. Oh, uh, look, this one's, this one's, uh, 
this one's a, a, bit, a bit on the uh, heavy side. We need a bit more damping. So instead of telling them, all oh, right, go past that setting, make it easier. You set the scale at the back there round for fat bloke scale or thin bloke scale as, as required. So if the ride is a bit heavier, what you do is tilt it a little bit more. This uh, Well, it'd be go, it'd going that way a bit. It, it, that heavier rider would want a little bit more damping. So you could make the scale in the background adjustable for weight. And, and it's only a weigh me once and set it. That's all. Now, I know that sounds complicated. Well, no, it doesn't sound complicated at all. You could easily do it. So that's my call to motorcycle manufacturers. Bring back manually adjustable suspension and make it easy. What, Royal Enfield? Adjustable damping? What do you think? <laughs> no, no, Royal Enfield would never do it. No, adjustable, adju damping, I, I don't think, no. They won't, will they? They won't.